What's up YouTube, I'm Domenico and I love to create art with code. This video I wanted to show you how I generated this picture and the algorithm that sits behind it. I'm starting with a square that I'm then recursively subdividing until a random number tells me to stop. And on each subdivision I apply a small transform like a rotation or a scale, which is then preserved by all the recursive children and ends up generating these fractal-like patterns. But enough talk, let's get started with the project. I'm using Vite and then I'm choosing vanilla JavaScript to download all of the dependencies that I need, in this case, FreeJS and Simplex Noise. Then I'm using this style.css file. It's just a simple way of centering the canvas, boilerplate index.html and main.js where all of the magic happens. You'll find the full source code of the project in the repo that I'll post in the description of the video. And now we can finally get started. We'll need to import some stuff, create a scene, an orthographic camera, we're using a renderer with a resolution of 800 pixels, setting the scene background and then rendering the scene. We can run the project with npm run dev and if all goes well, you'll see an empty brown square at the center of the scene. Let's now create a bunch of materials, create then a square function, which simply makes a plane geometry, picks around the material and then inserts it into the scene. We'll create a square that is 600 pixels wide and we're also making a transformation matrix and in a moment I'll tell you how we're going to use it. This is the result that we have so far and something interesting that we could do with this geometry is to change it with a transformation matrix. For example, if we start with the identity matrix, the square will remain exactly the way it is, but we can also scale it down, for example, by half of the value of the original square and then translate it such that it's placed in one of the four possible places where a subdivided cell could be in. And we want to do this recursively, so the square function will be called again inside a for loop that creates four children. Then, as we said, we'll start with the identity matrix, scale it down to half of its original size, and translate it to one of the four positions that could be occupied by this subdivided cell of the square. We'll keep a copy of the original matrix that was passed when calling the function and apply on top of it the new transform that is going to subdivide this square into a subcell. Finally, in the terminator block of the recursive function, we'll pick the matrix that was passed down to the children and scale it such that it covers the size that we pass as an argument. The order of operations here is important because we want to apply the scale value after all the recursive transforms are applied. And now we can specify any recursion level and it will keep on creating squares that are positioned exactly where they should be. We can go down normally six to seven levels before it starts being a bit expensive to compute, but we can make this even more interesting by using a specific logic to determine when we're going to recurse and where we're going to stop. Here, for example, there's a hard limit at level six, after which we're not going to subdivide anymore. But every time you enter the square function, there's also a 30% random chance that we're just going to stop here at the level that we are at without subdividing the cube further. And now we're starting to see a bit of the magic. Instead of rendering just one square, now we're going to render two. One will have its normal color, and the other one will sit behind it and be slightly larger. And the color of the square that sits behind it will have the same color of the background. We'll need a new material. And then inside the terminator block of the square function, we'll create another geometry. We'll also need a new matrix for the new geometry. And this matrix will be 90% the size of the original one, as in the square that is being rendered with this geometry will be 90% the size of the geometry that sits behind it. The reason why I'm scaling it twice is because the order of operation here is important and I can't just do size times 0.9, otherwise it would be displaced. And now we'll make things really interesting by applying rotation to the scene. And to do that, we need a noise function and then two constants for the rotation magnitude and the speed of the rotation along the x and y axis. Back inside the square function, I'm creating a rotation matrix that depends on a noise function, which on its own depends on the transformation matrix that we'll be using to displace the position of each of the squares that we're going to render. I will then apply the rotation matrix after the translation part. This alone can make the scene super interesting. We're getting very close, but there's another little detail that we could add to this type of scene, and that is a variation in the size of each of these squares, depending on another noise function and applying this scale value in the matrix chain that we have created here. 
So let's go ahead and create a variable that controls how strong the effect is and then go back to the square function, create the matrix and then apply it in the second step of the chain. And let's add one last final detail, another parameter that determines if the square will be rendered as an outline or as a fully filled square. The difference is visible here, for example, this will be the fully filled square and this is going to be the outlined one. And if the square is outlined, we'll simply invert the two materials. We also need a counter that increases each time a new square is rendered and this counter will translate the geometry a little further down the scene to prevent that it renders in the middle of other squares. Here is where I'm setting the counter and the super final, finalest, finaler detail of the scene is to decrease the scale value when the level is greater than 3 for no reason at all. And if you followed everything line by line, good job, you're now ready to smash the refresh button of your browser until you find something decent to post on Instagram. This part specifically takes me very, very long. And that's the end of the video. If you have feedback on how to improve this format, please let me know. I sincerely appreciate all the feedback and I hope you enjoyed this little tutorial and see you soon on the next one.